Hey guys, welcome back to the gun shop and we've got Nick Horton again with us today and he's brought some absolutely awesome, there's no better word for it, they are called fouling pieces, but cannons, hand cannons. Yes, I thought um, perhaps we, having done a bit previously where we, we looked at modern all plastic semi-automatics that perhaps we'd go back nearer to the beginnings of wild fouling and take a look at, uh, at the kind of guns that went before, what people would have used on the foreshore in the run-up to, uh, to the modern day. What I'd like to do is if, is if I can start with, with, with this one, which is a top lever, which puts it quite late. Any idea of the date when top lever would have come in? Uh, 1880s. 1880s, yeah. Um, it's got non-rebounding hammers, uh, and but sorry, what I haven't said is that it's a double-barreled ten bore. They're rebounding. They are rebounding. Yeah, rebounding. Yeah. Yes, Damascus barrels, not the highest of quality, but in, in terms of they're not poor quality, are they? They're, they're not bad, and I, I think as we kind of discussed before, um, this gun is was actually nitro-proofed at manufacture, and it's got surprisingly heavy barrels. But I think extremely, really, for the for the bore of the gun or for the size of the chamber yeah. length. But I think probably the reason for that is that if they were going to nitro-proof a Damascus-barreled gun, they put as much meat in it as they possibly could. Um, it's it was. We're talking real probably early days of nitro anyway. So there yeah. were nitro still wasn't the nitro we use to know today, yeah. and know and love today. It's, it was proofed at three tons, which, had it been a 12 bore game gun, would have been the lighter end of the uh, of the proofing scale. Um, and it's only got two and five eighth inch chambers, which is the shortest 10 bore. If I can just reach across you for a second. Of course you can. And there's a. He's very smart. There's a box, a, the original box of. How old do you reckon they are? Um, that's a good question. I'm thinking that they could be as late as the as the 1960s. Um, and, and so they could be significantly older than that. I don't profess to be any sort of expert on the cartridges. They're still connected on the label. Yeah, for some reason it's caught at the back there, and because it's worth a few bob, I don't want to, I don't want to break anything. But the, the cartridges themselves, if I can get one out, come on, cooperate. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Surefire primers, um, paper case cartridges roll turnover. If you've ever used paper cased cartridges on the foreshore it's a complete and utter nightmare. They swell, um, they stick in semi-automatics, ejector guns tear the heads off of the cartridges. Um, the, 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 the plastic case um, was a revolution in shotgun ammunition and the only reason I say that is that there is a rather in my mind, ill-conceived move uh, afoot amongst some to try and get the return of the paper um, shotgun case. Now, I mean, there is something delicious about a paper case. And the smell, with uh, particularly these earlier ones, the smell, is, the feel, there is. the work that goes into them. There, but people only get frustrated when they can't leave them in a garage for six months, take them out, and no. use them. And you, you've, you, you couldn't leave those overnight in your cartridge belt because they because they never fit in the gun again. If you stick those to one side, I'll of sort that out. They are metal lined as well, aren't they? Uh, does it say that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it does. So, um, uh, uh, this particular gun is made by Isaac Hollis. Um, Hollis had various London addresses, um, like a lot of gun makers at the time. <clears throat> They moved freely between London and Birmingham. I suspect that most of the components in this gun were made in, in Birmingham uh, and assembled by Hollis. He may even have bought them uh, as complete guns and just put his name on them. W whether or not, big bore guns, once, once you start getting into the tens, eights and fours, uh, a, a name that comes to mind um, is Tolly, J and W Tolly. Um, who, who virtually cornered the market in big bore guns. Uh, whether this started life in Tolly's workshop uh, and ended up with Hollis's name on it, I don't know. Um, it's, uh, it's nicely made. The, the engraving on it too is, is rather interesting. Um, it's a bit naive, isn't it? it it's, I think naive is a polite way to describe it, but certainly on the other side, um, on the lock plate, you've got what is undoubtedly either a busted or, or, or possibly um, a, a turkey. Maybe, maybe a peafowl. Or a peafowl. Something non-domestic. It, it ain't one of ours. 
Um, but the reason for that was that Hollis um, sold a lot of guns in South Africa, India uh, and indeed America. So my suspicion is that this gun probably started out um, in, in intending to be used in one of the colonies where it's robust construction, fairly heavy load um, and, and general kind of unbreakability. Potentially be... lower price point as well given a few of the less yes. exotic features. Yeah, and, I mean it, it's a it's a Hackett snap-on snap 4N um, which, which again um, I don't know quite what that suggests. It's it's. it's no... They came in and out of fashion fairly well, didn't they? Yes, I think my understanding is that they were slightly easy to make as well. Um, all of which, as we've said, points to this being not necessarily a top end gun, but none the worse for that. This is the kind of of thing that would have ended up in the hands of your average wild fowler shooting on the shore. Um, you'll see big bore guns with the names of Holland. Purdy, etc., on them. Um, they're, they're expensive second hand and they would have been correspondingly expensive to buy when they were new. Um, and the average uh, foreshore fowler would never have aspired to a gun like that. They would, even in those days, have been completely outside of their reach. Were they more of a own for the sake of ownership kind of gun yes. for those who could afford it? Yes, but certainly one like this would have been, you, you could have saved up your pennies um, and, and you could aspire to, to owning something like this. Nice inlet heel on it as well. Yes, steel, steel heel plate, um, a, a, a very practical um, uh, item even for, even for a modern wild fowling gun. Being able to stand it up on the, uh, on the, on the shore um, without taking big chunks out of the bottom of the stock is, is always a, a good thing to be able to do. Great screws, I mean it's, it's not a poor quality oh, no, gun, no, whatever we say about it, it they, yeah. it's, it's not nasty, it's just very much in the utilitarian branch yes, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so I think Being rebrand as well at some point. Is, yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I think that's probably um, the, the, the worst of the technical information about that particular gun. Um, and if we can move on to the two uh, muzzle loaders, these guns were uh, originally the property of, of Les Munden. Les Munden was a wild fowler who lived down at the Hardway on Gosport and shot in Portsmouth Harbour. Um, I, I knew Les to speak to, I can't say that he was a close friend of mine, but I certainly knew him to talk to. Um, he'd acquired these guns at some point in the distant past. Um, he was born, I think, in 1913 and died in 1980-something, but you'll, you'll see the actual dates in due course. Um, the, the one thing about Les that I always admired was that he really looked after his gear, and I suspect that both of these guns were worn when he got them, but they've certainly never deteriorated in the time that they were in his custody, which can't always be said about wild fowling guns, um, you know, some of which end up as total wrecks. Um, <clears throat> this one is a single barreled muzzle loading 8 bore. Nailer of, of Sheffield. Of Sheffield. Not a lot to say about it really. I, I suspect that it's quite a, a, an early muzzle loader. Um, muzzle loaders in the Birmingham trade towards the end of their manufacture became quite stereotypical. You'd have had an octagonal breech going down variously to a, I don't know what the technical term is, almost like a sort of a finial before you got to the, um, to, to the circular part of the barrel. This one, as we demonstrated earlier, it's, it's been very nicely made and the widest part of the barrel wall sits nicely between your hands. So even though it is an eight bore, which it handles quite nicely. It handles better than that. Oh uh, yes, it does. It's it's it, it has. It's fair to say probably had four inches lopped off the end of the barrel, but I suspect that that was for practical reasons <coughs> as much as anything else. In that the original barrel length would have been um, 34 inches odd to combust black powder, which which went through various development stages until it arrived at the black powder that we know today which is is not prone to separating out it's not prone to the damp in the same way that it used to be and I think that it was probably a practical um, idea that um, you could lose a few inches off the end of the barrel have a slightly handier gun but with no loss of ballistic efficiency 
given that it was being used well into the 20th century with um, with with black powder and lead shot. It was probably built pre-choke, obviously. So what I was about to say is um, completely irrelevant. I was going to say, do you reckon it makes a difference it not having any choke? But it was built pre-choke, so um, yes. it was a, it's a null and void question, actually. Yeah, I mean, what what I'd be interested to see is because. Uh, my suspicion is that it's it's an older muzzle loader and again sadly I don't have the means to to check this at the moment I'd be interested to see whether it's relief bored inside um, a, a lot of the very early guns were still relief bored in the same way that flint guns uh, uh, had been and it wasn't until much later during um, the manufacture of, of muzzle loaders that they abandoned the idea and just went for a straight internal tube yeah so, uh, uh, you know, at some point in the future, um, perhaps get the gauges down there and, and see what the innards look like. Oh, yeah, I, I mean, I must confess, I don't think I've got any gear that's going to be able to measure an eight with any no. sense. <laughs> so, <laughs> Can't imagine uh, many do. No, but we, we may never know. I, and I think always the, the, the problem with guns of this sort of vintage is trying to remove the breech plug, um, you know, which has been in there for God knows how long, um, it, it, with a big pair of Stilsons, not literally, but um, putting a lot of leverage on locked threads of metal of that sort of vintage is just it's as not likely. worth ruining it. It's, it's not worth you'll but you'll burn the edges, and, and in worst case scenario, the whole thing will shear off, um, and that would that would be utterly ruined. But um, again, it's got the same. It's got a metal heel plate. Uh, it's on got it. a significantly longer inlet. Yep, and significantly. More finer engraving, or it's more stylized. It's the old Acanthus style, isn't it? Yes, it's quite nice. And they put an escutcheon on this, but I said they yeah. put an oval on that. Yeah, the escutcheon is a little bit more uh, early, uh, isn't it? It's yes, fashion um, again. Yeah, um, that would shoot probably. Uh, I mean, the beauty of a muzzle loader, of course, is that unlike a cartridge gun, where you're restricted to to, to what the cartridge contains, you could you could stoke that up to if you were if you wanted to to as much as your shoulder could withstand. Um, probably a load of around about two ounces. Uh, it, it would have shot quite comfortably. They, they might even have shot it with an ounce and a half just to make it that little bit more comfortable. But you could rack it up to two and three quarter, maybe even three ounces. Um, and it would give you a fair old clump. So but a question, sorry, it's not even an aside. A question. Would they, having known, and both, this goes for both of these guns, not knowing, well, it's, it's a two-part question. Firstly, where did they buy their shot, or did it, would you think they would have made it themselves? <clears throat> and B, given they didn't really know what they were going out after, I mean, they might have had a fair idea, would they have mixed shot loads in there? Or is that just fable? I, certainly from, from, from my own research and talking to uh, to, to people who who were actually there, the, the oldest people, obviously, uh, you know, time being what it is that I've spoken to, started their shooting careers in the 1920s. But many of them came from families where their fathers and grandfathers uh, shot, and in, in many cases, for, for for reasons connected with the age at which their parents were sired, if you see what I mean. One particular friend of mine, uh, his dad was 60 when he had him, and his father's father was 60 when he when he sired him. So... A long time of it, it, information instead, getting passed. Instead of having there. three or four generations of people where the, the, the oldest would never know the youngest, and the information gets a bit lost, there was only two generations. So the... the information that was passed on from one to the other was was that much fresher so to answer your question um, there were gun shops um, and, and an area like Portsmouth um, was quite well served with uh, gun shops um, uh, there was Coles which was part of a chain that went right across the south of England with branches in Winchester Salisbury um, who'd been in business since the early days earliest days of muzzle loading um, in Portsmouth, you had uh, Worrell's, Sheriff Worrell, um, was in business for a relatively short space of time, but one of the guns of theirs that I saw recently um, was an 1872 uh, Wesley Richards patent ejector with Damascus barrels with Sheriff Worrell's name on it. It would have been worth a small fortune if it had had um, 
the original Wesley's Wesley Richards on it, yeah. name, but um, again, you know, bought through the trade. Uh, but gun shops thrived um, in, in Portsmouth. Newnham's is probably one of the most famous. Yeah. Newnham's were in business until comparatively recently. Um, and you'll find examples in four, eight, ten, single fours, double fours, breech loaders, muzzle loaders, now spread all over the country. Surfing the market, I guess, they but had at their doorstep at the time. In, indeed. And, and what you have to remember was special about Portsmouth, of course, was, was the naval and the military connection. We think today of Portsmouth uh, as a naval base, which of course it ha has been for centuries, but it was also a massive garrison town. So there were literally, at any time, there were thousands of naval officers, um, marines uh, and, and soldiers, army officers, all of whom would have had the, the depth of pocket to, 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 to go into Newnham's and commission a double-barrelled four-bore, which almost certainly was a tolly, but you know they'd have picked it up when they were next on shore leave, and it would have gone off to India, and you know eventually ended up with them when they retired to eventually travel around the world with them. Yeah, to, and whenever they, they retired to wherever around the British Isles is where the gun ended, kind of you know ended up um, uh, being used. So there's a, a, a tremendous hidden history of, of, of shooting and wildfowling in this particular area, <clears throat> not to mention the fact that gun shops throughout Hampshire, that, which have been reasonably well documented. Um, your question about shot, um, shot, t to the best of my understanding, was always relatively easily uh, obtained, either by mail order, uh, we're not talking, um, what's the modern mail order carrier, the big one? Um, Amazon. Amazon. We're not talking Amazon. It, it, delivery time would have been in weeks. But uh, one old punt gunning acquaintance of mine, at the start of each wildfowling season, he would buy a hundred weight oh, wow. of shot. And by the end of the season, he'd have used it all. Um, so shot was obtainable. You could send away for it. You could buy it from the local gun shop. Um, Likewise, black powder readily available over the counter in those days. There were no conditions, no certificates, no nothing. And of course, the other thing that Portsmouth was well known for, with um, black powder in particular, was that there were a number of ammunition breakers um, dotted variously around the island who bought ex military ammunition and then took it apart um, and sold the lead, the brass, uh, and indeed the powder. Um, and that's one of the reasons why many of the Portsmouth and Langston pump gunners, instead of using Colonel Hawker's grain powder, which is quite large as black powder goes, yeah. they used cannon powder because literally it came from old cannon cartridges. Yeah. Um, uh, and actually it was more ballistically efficient. Now that's another whole topic on, on its own. But um, you, you could go to various sources around the island and quite legitimately buy you know, pounds upon pounds of, of black powder. Um, so whether they resorted to making it themselves, I don't know. I'm sure somebody probably did. But it, there was no need all the way, even back when this was a gun, you could just go and buy yeah. it by order. Yes, essentially. Um, which kind of nicely brings us on to... Singularly the most impressive gun <laughs> I have ever <laughs> held. I've got, I've got to brace myself <laughs> to, to pick this one up. It's... It's a single barreled muzzle loading four bore. We know how the system works. The number of balls made from lead of a certain specific gravity that would fit down the bore to make a pound denominates your bore size. So at four bore, the, the, quarter pound. the surface load of this gun was a quarter of a pound of shot. This is a quarter pounder, the original quarter pounder. Indeed. Um, this gun is interesting in that although the, the barrel has been painted black, uh, it would originally, and indeed is, Damascus. Now, if you look here, you'll see that this is patently not the original lock. This is a tower musket lock, which dates from about 1830-ish. Around that sort of date, yeah. Yeah, don't, don't correct me on that if I'm too far adrift. But it, it's an ex-military musket, which has been fitted because the original flint lock uh, has been removed. This is what they call a drum and nipple conversion. 
the, the external gubbins, the lock work, the, the lock plate, the frizzen, the cock um, and the pan were removed. Uh, this plug was put in place with a percussion nipple on it, all lined up with the, uh, with the strike of the hammer and you went from a flint gun which would have been susceptible to the damp, to the wind. Just significantly less reliable. Yes. And, and outdated. And, and with the delay before it went bang um, to, to a gun which pretty much went off as soon as you pulled the trigger. Partly in defence of flintlocks, let's not forget that the flintlock ruled supreme for over 400 years. It was more effective in terms of its duration than the centrefire breech loader. Uh, and also, if you had a flintlock um, and you had an ignition failure with a flint, you could literally bend down on the beach, pick up a stone, you might take a few seconds to find one that fits, and it might, not look, it it might not look very pretty, but you could screw it into the, into the, into the jaws of the cock and, and the gun would go bang. So it it's, um, it's kind of swings and roundabouts. If you lived in the middle of nowhere um, and you had a flint lock, you could all always... All you needed was powder. All you needed was powder. You could always get it to fire. So you can see whether the, the original flint lock's been removed, the, the tower lock has been f literally fixed in place with... with a bit of filler. With, with filler. It's been screwed in from this side and then, then the holes around the, the ends have been filled with putty. Um, Does anyone still use flint locks out and about? Or are they, most I presume, were converted or are old enough to be museum quality pieces as opposed to... That, that's about where used. we are with it, yes. Uh, up until, uh, particularly for wild fowling, up until the changeover to, to non-toxic shot, there were a number of people who, I've, I've used flint locks and, and certainly muzzle loaders. Um, the, the, the problem has become essentially that most of the um, replacement material, steel in particular, steel being that much lighter, it, it doesn't necessarily work very well with black powder, which generates relatively lower velocities. But there's also the risk of more barrel wall damage which is awkward to yeah. get around with a muzzle loader. So um, what is it that you are actually loading into these muzzle loaders nowadays? Um, well, nowadays you, you, you've got the, the, the likes of bismuth is probably the one that's most used because that's the shot material that's least likely to damage the, the, the barrel walls. There are uh, all sorts of things that you can do by way of, of, of wraps that emulate the petals of a um, of a, of a steel cartridge which encase the shot yeah. completely, keep it away from the barrel walls. There, there's all sorts of, of get workarounds um, to, to do that with. So it, it, it's kind of, it is possible to keep a flintlock or, or a percussion gun um, in service, but it involves a lot more faffing around yeah. than it did Or just shoot pigeons with them, I suppose. Yes, as, as, a, pigeon, yeah, yeah. as a pigeon shooting gun or, or a game shooting gun, um, absolutely um, still usable slower to load but that's about all you really lost from yeah. it. it. It's important to say that <clears throat> uh, I'll, I'll get this gun, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll get Johnny to shoulder this gun in a minute with my problem with my shoulder, I can't lift it properly. But what you have to remember is that this, th these were more or less sporting guns. This, this was a bag filler. This was not the gun that you took for a walk round um, because you wanted to walk up a few Sport. This this was for commercial wild fowling, for keeping your family fed. The, the difference might have been if you were walking down the lane, down the hedgerow, um, and let's imagine that you had your, we'll say you had, the, you had a 12 bore muzzle loader. You see a covey of partridges in the field. Dog you, goes on point. You, the dog goes on point. You walk them up, and if, if you've got a single or double barreled gun, you get one or two partridges. With this gun, you'd creep along the hedge until you got as close to the covey of partridges sat on the floor and then you'd give them a quarter of a pound of shot on the deck and the idea would be to kill as many as you could. Um, in, in use for wild fowling, the, in, in some parts of the world where you had a lot of geese, you, you might well shoot at individual birds. They probably did down here with the Brent geese when, yeah. they, when they were not protected many years ago. But primarily this would have been a gun used from a boat, not necessarily as a punt gun, but simply um, just to shoot over the gunnels, to, to put your mud patterns on and walk up the bank and see what's in the creek over the, yeah. you know, over the top, particularly if you did it in the darkness or bad light. And again, you'd be shooting the birds on the water. Often referred to as bank guns, 
nothing to do with money bank, but everything to do with the banks that you get around um, the, the coast, where usually you've got a bit of water on the other side upon which the ducks would sit. Shot off a stick, do you reckon, or is that it's, a fallacy? I, no, I think sometimes they were. Um, uh, any old stick would do. I, I don't think there was any um, sort of particular type of rest that was developed with this, but there are historical records um, from uh, from Emsworth in particular. Uh, typically, you'd have a couple of blokes. One would row a, a rowing boat. They they'd use local knowledge to identify where a particular creek was. Um, like I said before, one bloke would get out of the boat on his mud patterns and very, very quietly walk up the mud bank because he knew just over the back was was another creek in which the widgeon were prone to, to sitting at that stage yeah. of the tide. And he would simply level the gun on the thickest part and, and give him the quarter pound a shot uh, on the floor. Equally, in those days, there were no seasons, there were no protected species. Um, a, a good shot with a gun like this would have been into a roost of Dunlin um, small shore wading bird um, which you might easily have got 30 or 40 birds at a shot um, and you have to remember also that today we're used to expensive accommodation and cheap food 150 200 years ago it was the other way around accommodation was very cheap food was very expensive um, probably 80% of a poor working man's wages would have gone on food oh, wow. 150 years ago. So uh, a, a gun like this would have kept the wolf from the door, it would have kept your family fed, um, and, and it's an important part of our kind of rural heritage. Would it have been expensive? There would have been an expense, but it would have been relatively easily offset by the profit that you might have made um, from from selling your, your yeah. bag. Uh, up until the, the Second World War, um, a pair of mallard were, was worth five shillings, two and sixpence each. It's a lot of money. In, in the days when somebody's, a, an agricultural labourer, was earning 30 bob a week. It really was that expensive. And if you shot 30 or 40 Dunlin, which you sold at a penny each, you'd have made the equivalent of a week and a half's pay at, at one pull of the trigger. So, yes, there was an expense. Um, but an astute businessman um, and a capable wildfowler could easily um, uh, you know, get that back over a relatively short period of time. My well, presumption is it wasn't as easy as all that in reality though, or else we wouldn't have any ducks. No. Well, I, I think the ducks are always better at being ducks than, than they are as targets for wildfowlers. Yeah. It, it would have been hard. Um, they would have been probably more wild than they are today. Uh, they are, uh, the other thing again, because we tend to look at things down the a different end of the telescope. Today, you can go wildfowling because you've got a car. There's nowhere in the country that you couldn't go wildfowling because you jump in your motor, you drive to the wash, you drive to Scotland, you know, north, south, east, west. Before the onset of the railways, um, which would have been from about 1860-ish onwards, prior to that, if you didn't live on the coast, within a couple of miles, of you didn't go wildfowling. Yeah. So it was only the people who lived nearby who could really indulge in it. So the, the, the pressure was significantly self-limiting um, uh, you know, back in the day. Yeah, less um, people, more marsh, less houses. Precisely, uh, very much so. Um, whether whether in, in, in factual terms there were actually more birds, it's a common misconception. I don't think necessarily that there were, but certainly there would have been a lot less human competition yeah. Um, uh, and, and a lot less other, you know, human interaction. Um, no, which I suppose the only thing is if we look around Portsmouth, for example, and you get rid of every house that was made post, let's say, 1920, there well, wouldn't be a lot left. If, if you if you if you took 1920 as your yardstick, the whole of the north end of Portsmouth, everything from the Green Posts pub north and out of the city, that that was open fields. If you go back to the 1860s and 1870s, the whole of Buckland, Stampshaw, Copner, Copner was a farm at one point, um, you, you've still got the, the, the building of Green Farm at, um, at Burfields, is it Burfield? Wherever it is. But basically, e even Portsmouth um, was countryside until comparatively recently. There was a thriving colony of wildfowlers who would have used guns like this in Portsmouth Harbour 
nowadays, of course, most, most of Portsmouth Harbour has gone, simply been filled in. Yeah. Um, so sometimes we tend to look at it through, as I said before, a different end of the telescope. Um, it, it, had I lived in those days, one of the first things that I would have set out to acquire would have been a gun like this, because it would have been the difference between I'm almost tempted to say starvation. A friend of mine grew up in the 1920s with seven, eight, nine, I can't remember, brothers and a sister. Um, they grew up fit, strong and healthy with straight limbs because their father shot. Um, not only did the profit that he made um, from selling the birds assist them no end, but of course they actually ate a lot of what he killed. Um, and all birds are made of meat, so they had plenty of protein in their diet. A lot of his neighbours, where the people were much poorer, they couldn't afford meat. You had the uh, the, the sight in the in the, in the in the twentieth century of children growing up with rickets, which is a, which is a deficiency of is it vitamin D? I can't remember. I couldn't tell you. Deficiency uh, of all sorts of things. It, well, I it's it's yeah. all sorts of things, it, and you know and it's it's not good if you if you've had rickets as a child you will not be a healthy person no it's a shame really but it's sort of goes to show what a symbol this is in in society that people have really forgot about actually i think that's that's another interesting aspect of it yes you know today you you've got increasingly this sort of urban element that um that try to demonize guns um and to demonize gun owners and yet you don't have to go back that far when uh, uh, the, the, uh, something like this in your house meant that you would a have been an extremely popular person in your neighborhood you know for people after a, after a, f a, f a few birds um, uh, uh, or you would have been much respected because of your ability to hunt yeah very nice uh, so would would these have been used with a dog, any of these? I mean, we've kind of discussed this one, probably not. Yeah, I, dogs, ah, interesting, it's another whole line of, uh, of of discussion. Dogs, of course, were expensive to keep. Indeed. Um, so, in, in terms of social strata, it probably would have been the, the wealthier people that, that, that managed to keep dogs. Um, there, there was next to no veterinary medicine, uh, you know, if you go back yep. much past the middle of the... In fact, well, as you probably know, the, the veterinary profession as such began in 1926. Before that, yeah. there were no vets. Wow. Um, my great-great-grandfather was, uh, was a blacksmith and a farrier. Uh, and, of course, uh, as a farrier, he also doubled as the local horse, dog and cat doctor, because that's about all there was, you know. Not that many people kept pets. Yeah. You wouldn't have seen a pet rat kind of thing um, for a whole variety of reasons. But he he treated horses, he, he treated dogs, he treated cats, he treated all the, uh, the, the, the minor ailments that they suffered from, uh, and including quite a bit of impromptu surgery, particularly with the larger animals. Uh, and, and, and in 1926, when veterinary qualifications were first brought in, it, it significantly knocked his pocket um, be, because all of a sudden he was competing with veterinary science. Of course, he carried on doing what he'd done for years um, and, and all his original customers probably kept with him because he undercut the, yeah. uh, the, the, the vets. But, um, but again, just as a sort of a snapshot into the past, um, it, it's quite interesting. Dogs often died of distemper in those days. Um, so for the working man, keeping a dog was um, potentially challenging. Um, but if you go to the other end of the, of, of the social scale, um, again, as I'm sure you know, let's look at a popular dog today, the Labrador. Yeah. Um, the, the, the Labrador was first brought into this country through Pool Harbour in Dorset. Um, the, the, uh, the, it was originally called the St John's Dog um, uh, and came in two distinct types. What we would now recognise as the modern Labrador and the other would effectively be the modern Newfoundland. But they came in a variety of sizes. They were part of the, um, the sort of circular cod trade that existed between Newfoundland and Pool and Dorset. And often the ship's captains or crew would bring back puppies, um, which they would sell locally. Um, there are a number of um, Labrador breeders to this day who can trace their 
um, their progeny right back to the early 1820s. Wow. So, but of course they would have been correspondingly expensive um, of course. Uh, and it, it just would have highlighted, I suppose, the social divisions that existed in those days. So, and, and curiously enough, I'll just say this, uh, for, for some years I've had in the past, I've had Chesapeake Bay Retrievers, which, which I like very much. The two of the dogs that, that founded the Chesapeake breed in America, re sort of recognisably, were actually taken off of an English brig that was sinking and the rescuers were given the two puppies as a thank you but that boat was destined for Pearl Harbour so it's interesting to think that had the crew not got drunk and you know run the ship on the rocks which is literally what happened what we would have now called the Chesapeake Bay Retriever its foundation stock would have ended up in Pool. it might well have been absorbed into the Labrador but if it went off to form a new breed you might have had the Pool Harbour Retriever or the Langston Harbour Retriever so you know it's strange sometimes how how history works um, the, uh, that we're talking about retrieving dogs yeah. because I'm kind of focusing on uh, uh, the, the water environment Spaniels were very popular because of their dual it's purpose slightly nature slightly later on I'm thinking well, uh, in fact what well, Spaniels would have significantly predated retrievers. No, I mean, in terms of when you were saying that people generally wouldn't have had a dog. No, they wouldn't have had any sort of dog. So they would have gone out on the boat that they were had or just waded out or swum out? Yeah, or? Uh, well, I think, I think something else you have to consider is that in this day and age, again, if we just look at Portsmouth, um, and let me take as an example Farlington Marshes. Nowadays, it's a nature reserve. You, you don't go shooting on the nature reserve for, for obvious reasons, not least because today there is a whole load of legal protection for it. It, it would be criminal offences to go shooting on the marshes. If you go back before 1950, nobody cared if you shot on Farlington marshes. And most of the people who l later formed the nucleus of the Langston Wildfowling Club all cut their teeth shooting on the fresh marsh because it was accepted. People didn't, didn't worry about P, uh, uh, about shooting shorebirds and ducks and geese and what People have you. People realised that you wouldn't affect their numbers if you shot not, there for if, every day for the season. Well, exactly, but not only that, but of course it, the, what the landed gentry were interested in was his partridges um, and, and his pheasants and, and the rest of it he couldn't have cared less about. So you, you would have shot in an area such as Farlington Marshes where you'd, the water that you would have been shooting over would have been a relatively small pond. So if you dropped a bird and you had no dog, you just walk around the other side and pick it up. Okay. Um, but of course, nowadays, where wild fowling, with a shoulder gun in particular, is more confined to the open estuary, then you undoubtedly need a dog, otherwise you would lose much of what you shot. So they shot in a different style to which they wouldn't need a dog to pick up. Exactly. And as such, who cares? Yeah, yes. Uh, but again, you, you've, got, you've got spaniels, setters, all, all of which um, sort of performed a slightly different function to that which they would um, perform today. Um, so that, whether that kind of answers your question. And of course, the other, the other extreme, even today, I know people who use mongrels, and, and they are mongrels, they're, they're, they're almost, there's nothing identifiable in them at all. Yeah. But they, but they will make, um, in in some cases, outstanding retrieving dogs, because they've been properly trained. Yeah. Um, so it isn't necessarily down to the breed. Um, if you're a capable dog trainer, you could, within reason, terriers and hounds don't make good and foundation Hounds really stock. don't. No. no. But you 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 could have a, some retriever. A, a Heinz 57, <laughs> which you could use. As, uh, a, as, a, as a retrieving dog and certainly if you go back far enough to the to the days when this um, when this fella was uh, was wet behind the ears um, you would not have recognized many of the dogs that you saw as being identifiable breeds yeah. because they simply didn't exist so if they did have a dog it was more likely a mutt yeah oh there you go oh, that's interesting oh, I'm just in awe of how monstrous this thing is it's pretty amazing uh, so we talked earlier about the fact it's got a huge amount of brass furniture on. Is that practical, fashionable? Is that how do you see that? I well, personally, we've got steel on both of these guns, and this has got brass. brass yes, yeah. um, I 
uh, I'd like to think that it was a, a practical ad adaptation because guns like this had a history, even in their even in their genesis, of being used on the coast because that was where the, 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 the majority of the quarry species that you could have shot best with this gun were, that somebody thought, well, let's use a metal that doesn't rust. Um, brass was particularly um, popular in the Navy, for the obvious reason, um, and I mean, you'd even find brass barreled cannons. Um, so I think it's partly that connection with the, the salt environment, um, whether, I mean, I think most of this is, is original. I mean, there's an odd screw hole here for which there's no accounting. Um, as original as any of this is anyway. Yes, and I, I, I think it's probably, it's, I think as you said before, a bit of a Frankenstein gun. It's, it's definitely had some work done to it over, yeah. over a long period of time, just to keep it in commission. But it is still absolutely amazing. <laughs> yes, and I mean, having shot fours before, that, that will go off with a big old bang <laughs> and you'll know you fired it. Yeah. So you've shot these at game? Uh, at live, at live, not literally these, but I've shot but, yeah, four, yeah. fours, eights, tens at, at, at wildfowl. What's it like? Yes. Um, four, more importantly, the, obviously, well, the, than the, everything the, else. The, the, the four, um, when we looked at this gun, the eight, we, we remarked how the barrel profile put a lot of the weight in between your yeah. hands and, and the handling of this gun was was actually quite elegant. It's quite pleasant actually, yeah. Yes. This this gun, as I say, was made for a slightly different purpose and it lacks that elegance and, and balance. We've all heard of C Colonel Hawker. Hawker had a gun made for him by Manton, the, yeah. the, the London gunsmith, personally made for him by Joe Manton himself which he called Big Joe. And Big Joe was a technically a five bore, because again, because it's just a tube, that nobody really bothered too much about whether it was four, five, or six. And a lot of four bores, modern four bores in particular, are actually technically six bores. So there's a degree of flexibility within the bore sizes. However, Hawker's Big Joe, of, of which a number of copies were made, it's a gun of the similar dimensions to this, but its handling qualities are much more like this one, if you can imagine it just being nice. slightly, yeah. slightly heavier. And it, it is, it's a gun that you could flight geese with it. You could shoot Widgeon on the shore uh, with it, whereas you couldn't with this. Th this is from a, from, a, from a previous era, when as we've described, it was for a slightly different purpose. When you move forward to this type of gun, where shooting flying, was was the object if you got one of those in four bore um of sufficient quality or built by someone who knew what they were doing they were actually quite handy guns to shoot N never light and comfortable um but you could hit stuff with them yeah so um yeah fours eights tens uh the eight bores today in the 19 late 1960s 1970s when uh, the supply of ammunition dried up, and I think we talked about this previously. Yeah. There was a period of a few years when you could buy eight bores, like people couldn't give them away. Nowadays, because the um, ammunition supply is, for the reasons that we talked about, um, is, is, is more secure, eight bores now go for telephone numbers. Yeah. A, a good quality double eight, £30,000. Nice, really. Yeah, beautiful guns. I mean, absolutely astonishing pieces of gun making. Um, wh whether you want to take that out on the foreshore at that sort of price, <laughs> I don't know. I'd like to think if I could afford spending £30,000 on a gun, I could afford to look after it as well. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, and in ballistic terms, um, it, it's a bit like, we often talk about the difference in practical ballistic terms between shooting steel and lead. They, they do perform differently and you, and you need to kind of get your eye in before, if, you, if you're moving from lead to steel, to, to get a slightly different um, sight picture. But once you've accommodated that, you'll start to kill stuff. It's, it's very similar when you're shooting, particularly with a, with a percussion gun, because the, um, the ignition is that much quicker, but the black powder itself is much slower. slower. 
Um, but it's still just supersonic, I would have thought. Just? Yes, I mean, I, I think the velocities uh, are, um, are certainly more than adequate, um, but definitely slower than, than in, in, yeah. in terms of velocity of what you'd be used to shooting with, particularly if you're shooting a high velocity steel cartridge, which you know might be doing 14, 15, 16, 1700 feet per second in some cases. Um, th this is nothing like it. And shooting a flint gun, always the issue, the, 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 the chemistry of the ignition of the powder, etc., is, is the same but it's the delay in the ignition you fire a flintlock you've got a split second with the fall of the of the yeah. of the hammer strike the frizzen flick the frizzen ignite the powder flash push. flash bang so, so yeah. it's, it's flash flash it, there's an awful lot happening in front of your face during which you've got to keep that keep gun, that gun moving. moving a significant way in front of the target yes uh, but people did it in the past and uh, you know quite we, effectively, we we very effectively we're still here so yes they what they are Absolutely beautiful. Um, and the last thing we're going to do, guys, you've probably seen a bit of already, we're going to take them out to the field and show you a bit of them in all their glory. So we're now outside, mostly because the ceiling is not tall enough to talk through the loading procedure, which we're going to start with. Nick. Yes. Um, the, the ground's a bit uneven, but of course it could easily be that wherever. So I'll have to, uh, I'll have to cope with that. Um, marshalling my thoughts. Muzzle loaders commonly were accompanied with lots of accoutrements which might have included a, a shot pouch of, of some sort, um, a, a leather pouch holding anything up to two or three pounds of shot with um, a, a device at the muzzle which came in a number of different styles but basically so that you could get a measured amount of shot from the pouch into the gun and you'd have something very similar for the for the powder. This, I think, from certainly from what we found um, when when the gun was uh, was uncovered, so to speak, <clears throat> was that its previous owner, Les Munden, had actually been kind of using his loaf and loading it in a sort of a hybrid fashion, which was more akin to uh, a small punt gun. And what he'd done was to make up some cartridge paper bags you know kind of long and thin that fitted down the bore which contained the the, the powder charge and the shot charge um, uh, each of those little packages wrapped up with a piece of string or, or silk thread so what he would have done was he'd have got one of these um, packets the powder first put it in the muzzle and then he'd have push that down to the bottom if it didn't fall and probably giving it a good tap to, uh, to, to just to split the bag. Um, what we didn't find with the gun was any sort of wad punch so I suspect that he was either using um, perhaps pre-purchased because you could still buy four ball wads until comparatively recently um, or perhaps he was simply using oakum which yeah. is unpicked rope um, which if you tamp it down firm enough you don't necessarily need um, uh, either a conventional wad or the overshot or under powder, no, over powder and undershot wads, cardboard wads that you would normally use, they're not absolutely necessary. So he might get a bit of um, oakum, roll it up into a ball, introduce that into the, into the muzzle and again the, the oakum would probably need a little bit of a tap to get it nicely home to obturate indeed to, to obturate and at that point it's worth mentioning <clears throat> I don't know if this the head of this rammer is in any way original um, but it, it is as you can see made of, of, of white metal of some sort uh, and the reason for that of course is that what you don't want with, a, with an iron barrel steel barrel and an iron ferrule is the chance of doing that and generating a spark whilst you've got a, in, in many cases, loose powder at the bottom of the barrel. So, um, the obturating uh, medium, be that whatever, introduced. Then the final package containing the, the shot. Um, again, ram it home, reintroduce the... the ramrod into the, into the rod pipes. If you were actually shooting from 
I mean, if, you, if, we were, if we were using this gun and shooting this river, you'd probably just get your ramrod and just stick it in the ground next to you, yeah. so that it was uh, so that it was to hand. Um, so you would go for a quick reload potentially, even with something well, that you, big. You could you could reload it fast enough. I mean, well, if we if we conclude the end of the sequence, then you'd you'd either have the caps um, loose in your pocket, or you'd use a cap dispenser. You pull the hammer back to half cock, put the cap on. You could either lower the hammer onto the cap, or you could keep the gun at half cock. But of course, when you wanted to fire it, you'd pull the gun back to half cock, and at that point, it's ready to rock and roll. So that's basically the loading sequence. What you've got to remember too is that this would have been an interesting day to have fired this because it's extremely still. And what happens is you get a huge cloud of thick grey white black powder smoke which stinks of sulphur and will just hang in the air <laughs> on a day like this probably for 10 or 15 minutes. Jesus. So um, you, you would have to bear in mind um, you know how that's going to affect what you're doing and I suspect on a day like this you wouldn't be worrying too much about how quickly you reloaded because you wouldn't be able to see anything until the what little breeze there is had blown the smoke away. So <clears throat> that's kind of the the loading sequence. Um, it's perhaps worth talking just for a moment since we're talking about the guns and, and very often it's the kind of ancillary stuff that gets forgotten about. What would our shooter have been wearing? Um, particularly in the days when this gun was new from the manufacturer um, and it was a flintlock and it might have been as early as 1750. If you start from the ground upwards he would probably, if wild fouling, been wearing leather thigh boots. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Leather thigh boots. Um, th the leather itself of course is not especially waterproof so the boots would have to be regularly oiled with an oil of some description. Yeah. Um, on the coast very often one of the cheapest oils that you could get was fish oil you know for obvious reasons um, but of course although it helped to waterproof the boot they did on a hot day stink, Smell, stink, of, yeah. stink of rancid fish um, but whatever you, you used um, the, the intention of that would be to, uh, to render them waterproof so that you would use them in the same way as you'd use um, a, a pair of modern um, thigh boots. I don't think chest waders had necessarily been invented at that point but the rest of the, the fowler's clothing would have been of a dull colour. Um, I think people understood the need to um, not to stand out in the uh, in, in the landscape. <clears throat> like a lot of older clothing um, and, and particularly if you look at the military equivalent of this in, in days gone by actually keeping warm was not so much a problem because most of the clothing would have been wool-based. Yeah. Um, with, a, with a heavy woolen coat, you'd have kept quite warm. The real problem that they had in years gone by was, was wet, was the rain. Not only would it affect a flintlock gun, but your woolen clothing in no time at all would become saturated yeah, and uncomfortable. Weigh 10 times and be exactly. colder than not wearing it. So the, uh, the, the, the cure for that were old-fashioned oil skins, literally, um, a, a heavy cotton jacket oiled with again one of a number of different you know patented um, waterproofing compounds and a hat of some description I suspect that the old the, the traditional old woolen hat would have been very popular to keep you warm it would turn the rain for, for a short amount of time but it wouldn't blow off your head um, uh, and I have an idea that if you were to see one of our old fowlers from a distance, you'd probably um, struggle to tell him uh, apart from a from a modern shooter. But it would only be when you got up close and you saw the differences in the materials of the uh, of the clothing that he was wearing that you that you would that the penny would drop that they you might be talking about two hundred years wow. apart. So, in conclusion, yes, um, I'm I'm hoping that we can we'll get to fire these oh one day that would be before good fun. 
before too much longer. But I will pursue that objective. Um, and th th they are certainly spectacular in, in operation. Um, not, not least because, I mean, certainly with a gun like this, um, when, you, when you fire it in the half light, depending what you're using as wadding, because quite often I personally have used newspaper for, for, for wadding uh, because it works very well. But literally the flame that you will get out of the end of the barrel is a good six feet long. It's a huge muzzle blast from when this. When your eyes aren't ready for it. And, and it's accompanied, of course, by a huge cl cloud of confetti, if, particularly if you're using newspaper. Uh, oakum and, and conventional wads behave differently. But um, yes, it's spectacular in the extreme. And I, I look forward to letting you uh, have a crack. Oh, it's going to be great fun. It really will be. Guys, thank you very much for watching. It's been amazing, fascinating. As always, Nick, I've really enjoyed listening as i hope you have too and even more so i've enjoyed handling that absolute monster what a treat pleasure's all mine